Welcome to Cruise Ship Crime Investigators, the book series. Book two, Serial Killer. Chapter 11, Kit for Jumping. Kieran and Hunter, both in unzipped bright yellow survival suits, pull their parachutes out of the trunk and swing them onto their shoulders. They walk from the limousine with a company executive. What we didn't discuss is it could be terrorists. Does that mean there's something you didn't tell us? Hunter asks. Kieran looks sternly at the company man. He has spent years working for politicians and military bosses where the truth is not always told to those on the mission. He was not expecting to be back in conflict at any level, and certainly not terrorism. Absolutely not, you have my word on that. But in your kit bag, there are four handguns. Security will lock them away as soon as you arrive. Hunter and Kieran are still absorbing information as they walk towards the waiting plane. This suit is bulky and uncomfortable, Kieran moans. It's a US Coast Guard approved NDM Solus, the accepted safety equipment of our employer and their insurers, Hunter says, cutting the company man off. Approved for dropping us out of a plane into the ocean? Kieran asks, knowing the paperwork will never say that. I take it that's an approved Airbus. He adds HC-144, Ocean Century. It's a US Coast Guard redesign of the military Airbus, used for search and rescue. The fuel tanks are enlarged. In fact, it's a fuel tank, Hunter tells him. So it's a flying liquid bomb. Let's hope they're not terrorists. The ship must be 900 miles away, so it's the only option, Hunter explains, dialing on his cell phone as he walks. Is that cruise ship crime investigators? He asks into the phone. They're out, is the reply he hears loud and clear. I know, Mary. Me and Phillips are about to go on a plane out to the Pacific. He shouts above the noise from the outside plane, which has its engines running. The crew start waving them to hurry. Then you're still out, she says. We're still out. Then you owe me for two lunches. I thought the deal was for breakfast. No, the deal with Mary was for full board. The phone goes dead. Who was that? Kieran asks. Our expensive office manager. The two men climb in. Kit bags follow them. The captain of the six-man crew turns around and gives them the thumbs up. Hunter returns the gesture and pulls on headphones. What's the hurry? Hunter shouts into comms. Weather's changing fast, and you guys want to jump, right? Kieran shouts at Hunter, not wanting to use comms, but having to rise above the powering engines as the plane starts to accelerate. Did you ask for backup? A data center in Miami processing power, and a man on the ground. Hunter checks his watch. It is three in the afternoon. What are the chances of getting us there before dark? He asked the pilot. None, but the ship will be lit up like Coney Island, the pilot communicates. Sounds like you're a long way from home, Hunter says. Where's home? The pilot jokes. I hear you on that, Hunter agrees. Then something hits him. What? Kieran shouts. I forgot to ring Elaine. You rang Mary, but you didn't ring your wife. Hunter looks to see if his mobile has service, but even if it had, she would never hear him, and his glove would not allow him to text. Call her from the ship. If you survive the drop and they find us in the water, Kieran shouts. Chapter 12. All lit up. There she is. The shout from the pilot wakes both Phillips and Witoski. It's far from quiet in a twin-turbo plane, but both these men have learned to grab sleep when they can, even in a war zone. They look down through the window. Coney Island, Hunter shouts into comms. I'm down to 14,000 feet and as slow as I dare in this wind, the pilot says. The two soldiers grab the small kit bags and clip them on. Nothing personal, the pilot adds, but I won't hang around. I'll be flying on fumes by the time I get back to Miami, and I don't want to have to put down earlier. The door is slid open. 
the wind rushes in. They both jump, and as they freefall, the ship seemingly accelerates towards them. In 60 seconds, they will hit the water. There is little time to make a mistake when you are hurtling to Earth at 170 miles per hour. Checking their altitude meters, they deploy at 2,500 feet, much lower than any domestic jumper would dare or be allowed to. There is no one up and ship or playing cheat. They both have friends who have died jumping. The parachutes rip open. Their bodies pull from 3 to 4 G as the parachute instantly slows their descent to about 17 miles an hour. It's clear landing on the deck would be dangerous. They, or the silk chute, could cause damage to the ship or themselves. They aim at two life craft waiting on the ocean. Kieran hits the water first, goes under and bobs up, buoyant in the bright suit. He realises the lifeboat crew are frantically splashing the water with oars. Get in quick! Sharks! The crew shout. Surrounded by shark fins, he swims, not looking around until he's being pulled on board. The crew push the great white sharks away as Hunter is pulled up. There were three of us, Kieran says. The crew panic and immediately search the water. A shark rams the lifeboat. It was a joke. Less funny than putting us in bright yellow suits so the sharks could see us. Let's go. Count my legs for me, Hunter says. Three, no four and a half. Chapter 13. Meet the Captain. Ruby is showing the two men the incident wall she has created in the cell, down by security on deck two aft. She draws their attention to the first area, on the far left of the wall, and walks them through all the details. Donna McGovern is the name on the top. She points to the pictures of the large woman found on the deck. There are pictures of her in situ when found, pictures of the bruising around her mouth, and the many very narrow stab wounds to her chest, all in the heart area. Weight 312 pounds, age 57, solo cruiser, cabin A107. That is deck four, our reception level. They turn sharply as the door opens. Captain Neil Reynolds, Neil announces as he enters. Hunter Wataski, sir. Karen Phillips, sir. Hit help. I apologize that our incident room is in our prison, gentlemen, but space is a premium on a full ship stocked to survive an 11-day crossing. And we want every little clue visible on a wall. Works for me, Hunter says. You've met our head of security, Senior Officer Ruby Jenkins. Neil checks, and then to create a chain of command, he adds, this is her incident room. It's my pleasure to reacquaint with an old colleague, Hunter says. Hunter, train me, sir, Ruby says. Ruby, they sent me to finish the job. I can only apologize for your first instructor, Kieran adds. I hope you're not suggesting that I need more instruction, she says, making herself clear. Three heads are better than one, Hunter says. The murders were only last night, and so far this is it. Most of the afternoon we've been catching up on sleep. We went right through last night. The captain nods as he studies the war for the first time in this full state. How many hours are you behind schedule, sir? Hunter asked the captain. Seven but we can catch that up. There's a long way to go. Sure, but the guys on the aircraft said severe weather ahead. I'm watching it, the captain says. We need to find the killer, but I don't want the job killing my crew. This lady needs rest, and when you're ready, we should eat. Neil leaves and they turn back to the wall. Both men start to read the red napkin in the plastic A4 sleeve pinned to the wall. Napkin from the main dining room. It was found in her mouth with the phrase written on it. Main dining room? Kieran asks. Deck six. Cause of death? Hunter asks. Multiple but accurate tiny round stab wounds to the heart. Death being almost instant. The doctor suggested a needle. Bruising alludes to the fact that her mouth was covered while she was stabbed. Kieran has picked up on the descriptive notes elsewhere on the wall. 
Why is blood on the thigh area of her dress? The weapon may have been cleaned on it. Size of the clean suggests a long weapon, Hunter says. Apart from her size, she was in good health. Her atrium photograph from earlier that evening sees her with two walking sticks. Only one was found by her body. Ruby looks at the two men, who are both absorbing information. Kieran points to the pictures of the second body. Peter Kirshner, found in the sea. Pictures on the lifeboat and on the gurney. Weight 210 pounds, age 58, solo cruiser cabin A103. That is near Donna, but that may be a coincidence. Cause of death? Kieran asks. Initial findings suggest death by drowning. There is a head injury, but that could be from a blow or hitting something during a fall. Similarly, there are signs of bruising, possibly a fall or a struggle. But the big note here is that he was found with another guest's cruise card in his pocket, not his own. The stranger thing is that he was checked in at the muster station roll call after the first death. That was after his mask was found in the ocean and about five hours before his body was found in the sea at sunup. Ruby pauses as the two men take all this in. You've done all this in one morning? Kieran asks. I had a good teacher, she says, glancing back at Hunter. You don't need us, Kieran says. Watch him. He's a flirt. We need to work as a team, Hunter says, as he steps to the next wall.